we're going to uh, look at a summary of our study uh, in uh, in Romans, uh, and I've uh, I just got to got to warn you, I've got about twice as many notes as normal, so I'm going to talk very fast. You know, I, I I'm hoping that uh, this is beneficial. We did it, you know, when we finished Genesis, and and um, uh, I thought that was a blessing. And there's certainly uh, uh, some things that are worthwhile to go back and uh, and talk about. And uh, it's my hope that uh, just following along with me in, uh, in your Bibles, I'm not giving you any notes because I already gave them to you once already. So hundreds of pages, so and they're all available on the web if you want to go back and do any of those studies uh, uh, over again. But I uh, hope it'll be a benefit to you. It, it's, uh, this is, uh, it's like uh, one, one uh, little boy said uh, uh, in Sunday school, I'm going to draw a, a picture of God today. And this teacher said, well, you know, we don't really uh, know what God looks like. He says, you, you will know when I get done. And, uh, well, uh, you know, in a way, if we, we thought we're not exactly sure we fully understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, the apostle Paul could say, you will when I get done, in terms of uh, the uh, epistle to the church there in, in Rome. I, I read a story uh, last week about uh, a cargo ship that left Hong Kong going for the United States in 1992. It had uh, some containers on it that were lost at sea containing uh, 28,000 plastic toys. So uh, rubber ducks, turtles, frogs, etc. And uh, of course the containers eventually broke open and the uh, 28,000 plastic toys uh, then began their journey through the Pacific o Ocean. Uh, as one writer said, a few lucky ducks landed in Hawaii, uh, but a lot of them went to Alaska, South America, Australia, Pacific Northwest. Uh, they've been found frozen in the Arctic ice. Others made it to Scotland. Newfoundland uh, and even to the uh, Atlantic. But 2,000 of them uh, ended in this area called the uh, North Pacific Gyre. It's basically a, a big trash heap uh, that's floating in the Pacific Ocean, uh, again, uh, east of Japan, you know, west of Alaska and the Lucia Islands. There's just, uh, it's just where, where the currents and uh, I think I had a surfboard up there somewhere because I, I lost one, uh, you know, surfing on the North Shore. The current ticket, I never saw it again. And uh, that might be where it is. But uh, anyway, this, uh, this thing exists up there. I guess it's just massive. Uh, and 2,000 of the toys uh, are still up there uh, bobbing around uh, 20 years later, uh, 20 years plus. Uh, but once in a while, they still find them uh, floating up on shores. Uh, and that, that's only because occasionally, uh, the wind, wind blows uh, strong enough, marine life uh, bumps into the ducks or whatever it might be and pushes them out of that current. In other words, they are there <laughs> till Jesus returns and uh, unless something intervenes and bumps or moves, or, but it's got to be an outside force to set them free from the thing that they're entrapped in. Uh, and certainly that's a picture of our condition in terms of our, our own sin. Uh, if God doesn't intervene from the outside, we are trapped, in a sense, uh, in our sin and in our sinful nature. Uh, and that's much of what Paul is uh, writing about here. First, we want to say that the premise for the book of Romans is the ex explanation of salvation by grace. And, uh, and again, at the beginning of the introduction, uh, many months ago, we talked about uh, its influence and how it's, uh, this, this letter that we've just finished has changed uh, the world that uh, we live in today. Uh, we mentioned Martin Luther, uh, a, a good Roman Catholic monk uh, who was struggling with his uh, uh, lack of relationship with God uh, despite all of his devotions uh, and good works and so forth. But he's asked to teach through the book of Romans. He's a scholar. He was Greek, Hebrew, Latin. He studies it in the Greek. He teaches it and discovers what really hopefully was obvious to us that nobody is saved by their good works. They are saved uh, by their faith in Jesus Christ uh, and that alone, which led then to uh, the Protestant Reformation uh, in a, a complete reshaping uh, the geopolitical world of uh, Western Europe at that time. Uh, then, a number of years later, a man named John Wesley, who is a minister by vocation, uh, but does not know Christ personally. Uh, yes, you can do that. And, uh, but he is, uh, he is reading one day through Martin Luther's introduction to uh, his commentary on the book of Romans. And as he reads through it, he realizes that he's been all of his life also trying to attain a relationship with God through works. He realizes it's by faith. Uh, he comes to faith in Jesus Christ. His life is radically changed. 
and God uses them not only in Great Britain, but in this country in what we call the Second Great Awakening. We could talk about John Bunyan, we could go on and on, people whose lives then were changed by Romans and impacted uh, the world that they lived in. Uh, we're in uh, if you want to follow along, we're in chapter 1, I'm going to read first from uh, verse 15, uh, where Paul mentions his passion uh, of the gospel and to go to Rome. He says, so as much as, uh, as in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel uh, to you who are in Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Uh, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So Paul, again, very importantly, very uh, 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 important verse, uh, says that he is not ashamed of the gospel. Of course, he, uh, his own passion, he says that, uh, uh, you know, he uh, just wants to get to this group of people, though he's, uh, uh, he's never seen them, never known them. Uh, but he knows about Rome, and he knows what it's like, and he knows how, how desperately they need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We think of the Roman Empire, quote, in its, quote, glory. But again, they had no culture. They just took it from the Greeks. They had a great military. Uh, and, but uh, they, uh, they had peace in the world because of their, uh, of their strength. But the people in the Rome, well, they were just kind of debauched. You couldn't find an orphanage. You can't find a hospital. You can't find. You couldn't find anything in an archaeological remain that would indicate that these people ever cared about anybody other than themselves all the time. Half of them were drunk uh, half the time, uh, just going to watch people fight and kill and die in the in the Colosseums. Uh, that's the city that uh, Paul is hoping to get to uh, with the gospel. One writer said that when Paul preached at Jerusalem, the religious center of the world, he was mocked. When he preached at Athens, the intellectual center of the world, he was mocked by some. Some listened, but he was mocked. When he preached at Rome, the legislative center, he was masterful. He was ready. He was not ashamed. Not ashamed of the gospel. And he says it's because it's the power of God. And that's the word we're familiar with as Christians. Dunamis, as in the Holy Spirit shall come upon you with power. We get our English words dynamic and dynamite uh, from that Greek word. Right into the church in Thessalonia, he said, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. And, of course, gospel means good news. Good news because it has the power to change somebody's life. Uh, his preaching, of course, he said, would be to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And that was his pattern in the book of Acts. Always to the synagogue, trying to reach people that had some scriptural foundation to their lives that he could reason through the scriptures, uh, but eventually then to the Gentiles as well. And then he uh, says it's a gospel, for in it is the righteousness of God revealed, and, uh, uh, and it's no wonder that he was not ashamed of it. Uh, the righteousness of God that is a radical heavenly righteousness in Romans 5.17, he calls it the gift of righteousness. Again, it's not human made it's from God above uh, verse 17 he says for in it the righteousness of God is real from revealed from faith uh, to faith uh, and then eventually quotes Habakkuk 2 4 the righteous will live by faith so that's his gospel he's not he's not going to be ashamed of it it's the power of God unto salvation he wants to go to Rome with it uh, help them understand that we're saved by grace alone and then from chapter, after the introduction, the principles of righteousness from chapter 1 to chapter uh, 18. Uh, the first one we saw was that of condemnation. And we see that in verse uh, 18 uh, of chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. So three statements about God revealing himself. One is the wrath of God is, uh, is revealed. It's a word that's used 36 times. Uh, it could be uh, used to anger, but that would kind of help us misunderstand what it really means. It doesn't mean that uh, God has this anger and he's had this wrath and he just kind of flies off the handle. Man, those guys are, I've had it. They're getting it now. Uh, that's not what the word indicates, or gain, that's uh, used here. It means a perfected, a settled, a controlled state of being. God will, in his time, and against who? All ungodliness, he will unleash his wrath at some point in time in the future. Uh, parallel to that, what is revealed is his, uh, his own righteousness. 
Again, uh, the wrath of God is revealed, but a righteousness from God is revealed as well. Uh, both of these things together. Paul's leading up to, again to make his point. Everybody's condemned. Uh, there is uh, all have sinned to come sure of the glory of God. He'll summarize in chapter 3, verse 23. And that's the first thing we need to understand. No, nobody's going to get saved if they don't realize they're, they're condemned. Uh, uh, no, nobody uh, out there uh, uh, off Kailua or off the North Shore today in front of a lifeguard. The lifeguard's not just going to charge out and grab some guy swimming out there and haul him in. They don't do that unless somebody says, I'm drowning out here and, uh, and, I, and I need some help. We all have to come to that conclusion. We talked to, tried to make these early chapters as practically as we could in terms of sharing and witnessing to others. One of the things you need to pray for is that people would realize they're condemned. Realize they have a need of a Savior. Realize they're lost without Jesus Christ. Realize that there really is no hope for them. Uh, there is an afterlife. Everybody realizes that. They're wondering about it. They need to, we needed to come to the conclusion. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that leads us to repentance. Paul says we need to come to faith in Christ because we recognize uh, the condemnation. Uh, and then Paul goes on to make sure we realize that, hey, and everybody knows, uh, and everybody is without excuse, verse 19, because what may be known about God is manifest, it's been made known in them, for God has shown it uh, to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in God, and so that men are without excuse. Uh, again, Creation. It doesn't matter where someone is in the world. It doesn't matter if they ever got a gospel track. It doesn't matter if they ever got a Bible. It doesn't ever ever hear someone preach the gospel. Everybody has the same opportunity to look up, to recognize that this, uh, you know, the, the the planets in motion, everything that's going on around us, it, it could not simply happen by uh, by. Um, by a, a chance, a time, and matter somehow coming together and arriving at this, what we live in today. I'm going to show you on a Wednesday night in a couple of weeks a, a great a new video called uh, Evolution Versus God. Uh, and it's simply a guy uh, on a college campus uh, with its, uh, it's kind of a technical school, so he's going to interview people that are science majors as well as some uh, professors and simply ask a question. Can you give me proof, just one proof, uh, for uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. And of course they all say the same, I can give you thousands. Well, that's great. Can you give me one, just one? And, uh, and of course, well, you know, there was the finches and their, their beaks, you know, changed it. And, and afterwards, were they still finches? Uh, well, yes, they were still finches. Well, can you give me another one? Because a finch is still a finch. That's just an environmental adaptation that they made. Well, there's the bacteria, and we've noticed it. And afterwards, it changed. Was it still bacteria? Yeah, it was still bacteria. And this goes on and on. And, uh, and it just comes down to what we said all along. There is no proof for evolution. You have to make a tremendous leap of faith. And actually, some of the students in the end uh, admit that uh, in, in the video. Uh, but Paul says that truth of God being the creator is suppressed. Uh, and we live in a time when it, uh, it is suppressed. But if you're going to share your faith uh, with someone, as we're kind of going through with the kids, uh, the high school kids on Friday night, you have to begin not with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but did the universe have a beginning? You have to show them that it's obvious that it does, and if it had a beginning, it had to have a begin or. Uh, and that begin or is, uh, is God. Paul says everyone will be accountable to God. We're all condemned. Uh, and no one is without excuse. Uh, and then he deals with the religious person as well as uh, the Gentile, or, or he says the, the Greek. And notice uh, uh, verse 20 begins, they are without excuse, uh, everyone. The Gentiles without special revelation, without the law, will be judged. Uh, the Jews who sinned according to the law will be judged. Uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody's in line for judgment. Our good works, our good deeds, will just not get us there. Uh, Bernard Edwards was the, uh, uh, the CEO of WorldCom when it fell. It was an $11 billion accounting fraud, $11 billion, that caused the uh, collapse of that uh, telecommunications company. Uh, of course, he lawyered up, and it was interesting what his lawyer said to the judge pleading for him. The lawyer's name was Reed Weingarten. 
Uh, he uh, brought 169 letters from Eber's supporters. Uh, the 63-year-old had a heart condition, and uh, he made mention of his numerous charitable gifts and so forth. And he said, quote, uh, if you live some 60 uh, years, uh, if you have an unblemished record, if you have endless numbers of people who attest to your goodness, doesn't that count? Doesn't that count particularly on this day? And the judge said, no, 25 years. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter the good deeds that you've done. Uh, uh, in his case or our case, uh, Paul says, all men are condemned, and women, uh, and all are without excuse. That was our first principle. The second one was that of justification. We actually gave you a definition for that. Justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous in Christ on the basis of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Uh, we're in a desperate condition. We can't help ourselves, uh, but God does it uh, by sending Christ to die on the cross for us. When we place our faith, then God says we are at that point justified. Uh, we see that in chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We said four things about justification, and maybe the first one is the most important, that it is an act and it's not a process. There are no degrees of justification. God simply judicially, as a judge, declares you to be righteous. Are you righteous? No, we're still sinners, and we still sin. But he declares us to be righteous, and in Christ we are righteous. We have a righteousness uh, from him. And it's important to see that, that it is an act and not a process. There are uh, groups like Roman Catholicism, for example, but there's others that teach that justification is a process. It goes on and on. I'm sorry, the word just doesn't mean that in the Greek. It's never used that way. Uh, it's not a process. It's a one-time act. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, God declares us to be righteous. Uh, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, it's a one-time act. Secondly, uh, justification is in Christ alone. Uh, in verse 22, he makes that very clear again. Even the righteousness of God, how is it? Through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who do good works, no, on all who believe. And again, it's by faith alone. Uh, again, law righteousness, we'd say, is a reward of works. Gospel righteousness is a gift through faith. And then fourth thing we mentioned about justification is the tremendous cost, the great cost. Verse 24, some very key words here. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. Salvation is free, it's not cheap. Uh, it costs the, the life uh, of God's son. Propitiation, uh, that's uh, God's wrath that's coming, but it's turned away because of a sacrifice that's been offered. Redemption, that's the, the picture of the person in the slave market, but the price is paid and they are, uh, and they are set free. Uh, and then the blood of Christ, that was the ultimate price. Peter says, we were not redeemed with silver or, blood, but by the, silver or gold, but by the blood of the precious lamb uh, of God. It was a high price. Uh, it's free to us, but it was not cheap. Justification, point number two, very important. If you didn't get anything else out of our study, if you came to understand justification, you, you might just re have your life changed and be set free. Uh, I can tell you my... Uh, uh, my father-in-law, when we were doing the study a number of years ago, who was raised uh, uh, Rome, Roman Catholic, like a good uh, I, uh, Irish Scotch boy that he was, and uh, and uh, he, uh, we were having dinner with him uh, on a Sunday night. It was, was our, our habit and uh, barbecuing, and I, I'd always talk to him about uh, you know the sermon. What did he think? And he says, "Well, it made me very upset. I'm actually very angry." So, well, that's. Not good to have your father-in-law tell you that. That's kind of, hope you might have liked it a little, you know. I don't know, you know. I said, well, what bothered you? He says, because I went to church my entire life, and they never told us that. They never told us that. Of course, he was referring to, you didn't grow up in a Calvary chapel. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and it was not that long after that that uh, he came to faith in Christ. Uh, we have to understand that we're all condemned. 
uh, and then it's meaningful what Christ has done for us on the cross. He justifies us. Third, we went to the principle of sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer once we've come to faith in Christ. And we even then stopped and did a whole separate message and Paul right in the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 3.18 where Paul says, we with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And again, that word transformation, that's a great word. We just say it into English now, metamorphosis. Uh, there's a, a change. It's an internal change. We're not by following some code or rules or regulations trying to conform ourselves. It's actually the Holy Spirit internally uh, doing a work in us, changing us. Because it uh, again, if Paul says, to, as his critics would say, well, if you tell people they're saved by grace and grace alone, uh, aren't they just going to go out then uh, knowing that they're justified? And nothing can ever change that and just sin. Uh, and he says, well, uh, that's not likely. Uh, he's, and he gave us four reasons uh, in, the, in that passage. One, he says, we have a new life, and he compared it to baptism. It's like you're, you, you go in the grave and you come out of the grave. If somebody's given you a new life when you were dead before, why would you turn back to the dead life? He says we're given a new nature, uh, no longer bound to the self-centered, sinful nature, but a new nature in Christ, now with the ability to care and love and give towards others, which gives us true meaning and purpose. And then there's a new, new power. Uh, look at verse uh, 11 of chapter 6. Likewise, you also <laughs> reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. We have a new power operating in our lives the power of the Holy Spirit. At one point he says, it is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Therefore, it should be pretty sufficient to be able to bring change and transformation to us. And then we have a new choice. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. And then he illustrates that. And his illustration is that of slavery. And that's in verse 16 to 18. Because he's going to say... Uh, as, uh, as we sing on the occasion of, uh, uh, of doing this study. Well, you see if you can remember the song as we go through it. Verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, option number one, or of obedience leading to righteousness, option number two. But thank God... But God be thanked that through you, uh, you were, though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So his principle here is that, hey, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. So said Bob Dylan. Uh, of course, this was the time that I thought Mark knew the song, and I emailed him on Saturday night, hey, can we do that song? Actually, it was a different Bob Dylan song that we did, so then Mark stayed up till four in the morning to learn that song. See, I remember. I appreciate that. And then we, uh, we, we did the song. Uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime. But that's Paul's principle. That's just, would you go on sinning? He goes, well, listen, I can tell you, you're going to serve somebody. Uh, you can continue to be a, a sin unto death, or you can be a slave, uh, or, or slave unto death, or a slave unto righteousness. And certainly, Paul's listeners and uh, understood this well. Uh, again, the vast population of Rome were slaves uh, at that time, uh, and uh, and many freemen had once uh, been slaves. It's been estimated that half the Roman church were either slaves or had been enslaved uh, at one point in time. They know exactly what he's talking about. You do have to serve that master, and you better choose well who it would be. So Paul says, you think that somebody comes to faith in Christ, they're justified now, God's spirit is working in them, they have a new nature, uh, they have a new life, they have a new power, and they're going to go back to the old life and serve and become a slave to that again. He says, I don't think that's likely. Notice he says, do you not know? In other words, he assumes his audience certainly knows this to be true. So who are you in, uh, obeying? And today, you know, there's the application because we can obey our careers. We can be a slave to them, uh, to our possessions. Uh, there is a limitless amount of uh, those things that we can be enslaved to. The ill-tempered is enslaved to their tempers, the sensual to their bodies. But either way, we will all serve somebody. But we've been justified 
by, uh, by God, uh, and certainly that's <coughs> positionally, but practically God is still working. Again, our topic here is sanctification, changing us, transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. Paul then goes on and reveals in verse 15 to 20 his own struggle uh, with this whole issue. Uh, where he says in verse 15, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. And he goes on. Man, that's like, I want to serve the Lord and I want to act like this. But I end up acting like this. I'm concerned about being like that. I end up doing that instead of that. And he goes on and on in his frustration for five verses. Then he says in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He doesn't say what will save me. He says who will save me. It's not a what. It's not a rules and a regulations. It's not a certain aspects of the law. It's not any of those things. It's not living in a certain place or worshiping in a certain way. Uh, it's, a, it's a who. It's Jesus Christ, his Savior. And the way that Jesus Christ, our Savior, saves us from this body of death and this frustration is by giving us his Holy Spirit so we can be led by the Spirit of God and no longer bound to the flesh. And then that becomes his theme for the next chapter. The Holy Spirit has only been mentioned on two occasions. In chapter 1, verse 4, the Spirit of holiness. Uh, and later there in chapter 5, verse 5, talking about uh, the Holy Spirit pouring out the love of God in our hearts. Now it becomes the theme in chapter 8, uh, and it's used some, some 20 times. The work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Uh, we're all condemned, but we can be justified. When we're justified, we can be sanctified. The work of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, which leads to chapter 8, and we looked at the principle of the security of the believer. Uh, it begins, we said, with no condemnation. It ends with there is no separation in the uh, uh, as this chapter has become beloved to many Christians through, uh, through the centuries. Hopefully our study brought it uh, uh, in that sense to our hearts as well. Well, we kind of picked apart verse 1 because it's very important where Paul says, uh, again, 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. We're no longer condemned because we're in Christ. And we just to delineate a little bit here, a couple of the, uh, the Greek terms that um, hopefully will make this a little more meaningful. The therefore, we said, was uh, in a Greek, a double adverb. That means it's not referring back to the therefore. You always, when you see a therefore, see what it's there for. Uh, it's not a reference back to what's just been said. It's, it's a reference to what's just been said in its entirety. In other words, there's no condemnation when there was at one time. But we've been justified. And we're being sanctified. And because of that, there's no condemnation. That's the idea. That's the therefore. Uh, condemnation is the idea of penal servitude. It's the idea of judgment. There's no judgment uh, because we're justified. And the word no, we said in the Greek, is an emphatic negative. In other words, it's like a double negative in English. Therefore, you could read, therefore, there is now. No, no, not now. No, not ever, ever, any condemnation to anyone ever who is in Christ Jesus. That's, that's the idea. And um, in some other Christian circles, I've probably got a few amens out of that, but we'll just move on. Uh, it's a very important verse, a very important uh, verse to, uh, to, uh, to understand. There's a power at work within me to make me do what I don't want to do in Christ, but there's a greater power working in me that overcomes that. As we tried to illustrate that by the idea of the power of gravity and how it can hold us to the ground. But there are some greater powers and principles of aerodynamics that we've all experienced when we get on a plane and, uh, and those engines get going and we get that lift you know, under those wings and it takes us into the air. The power of gravity is still there, but there is a greater power that is at work uh, in our lives. That's the spirit-led Christian as we yield our lives to Jesus Christ. Paul says in Philippians 2.13, For it is God who works in you. It's God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And, uh, and Paul says we should rejoice in this because God is consistently working for us. Look at verse 31. 
What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And of course, we can say, well, I'm pretty sure the devil is still against me. And I'm pretty sure that this world system is still against me. And I'm pretty sure that I've got this sinful nature that I'm still dealing with here. But the idea is it's rhetorical. But compared to God being for you consistently, always, uh, that, that, that should have no influence or, or, or meaning to us. But sometimes we're like Jacob in his lament in Genesis 42 where he said, all these things are against me. Uh, but Paul would say, no, all things are actually working for good uh, for you. Gideon in a moment of weakness said in uh, Judges 6.13, one of my favorite verses, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why is all this happening to us? I know you've never said that, but I have on a few occasions. Uh, but uh, Paul would say, well, I don't know why it's happening, but I do know this. All things are going to work for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes because God is consistently for us. And then he says that circumstances can't separate us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? So in verse 35, I think it's autobiography. I think, I think he's experienced all, all of these things. And he's speaking from experience. Uh, and the, the word who can also be translated what. So it's not just who might separate us. It's what might separate us. Uh, and he quotes Psalm 44, 22 to show that, well, tribulation is nothing new to the believer. Uh, but his whole point is that circumstances, whatever these things are, cannot separate us. And actually God can use them for good uh, and for his, his glory. So we endure trials for his sake, verse 36. Uh, but when we do it, we never think that he's deserting us because he is consistently for us. Again, verse 35 includes the peril uh, or the sword. What's the point of the, the sword? Well, death. Even death can't separate us from the love of God uh, that's in Christ Jesus. And it's because uh, not only that, but nothing created, we said, or even supernatural can separate us. Look at verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We might add disappointment, neurosis, disease, a broken romance, a financial crisis, and we could go on and on. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Why? Because we were condemned, but now we're justified. God's Spirit is working in us, sanctifying us, and nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. This is an important epistle. How do we know that? Well, Paul gave us seven reasons in chapter 8, just to mention them briefly again. Because God is consistently for us. Uh, with one conclusive act, God demonstrated his love for us. And because of that, no one can bring a charge against us. Because God does not condemn us. It's because circumstances cannot separate us. It's because we're more than conquerors. And it's because nothing created or even supernatural can ever separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Now, can I get an amen there? That was, yeah. those, are, those are awesome things. And we went through those point by point. I don't even know if we made it through seven in one week or we took two weeks to do that. But uh, it's all there in chapter, chapter 8. So the, again, the premise of the book is to try to explain salvation by grace, by grace alone. He lays out principles of, of righteousness that we've just gone through, four of them. That took us to chapter 9 and problems. There's problems of the righteousness of God. What are the problems? Well, the Jewish people. In other words, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, comes. They reject him nationally. And they reject him. So is that a problem? What do we do now? What about the promises made to them? Uh, does that mean that God's not going to keep his word? Does that mean he's not going to bring a millennial kingdom? That means the Messiah is not going to rule and reign from Jerusalem on the throne of Jacob? What do we do with all these promises? Is that a problem? Because if God is not faithful to Israel, how do we know he'll be faithful to us? So Paul begins to address these issues and these problems. Remember writing primarily to a Jewish audience. This would be of a particular interest. And he begins by saying his own passion for the Jewish people. He said, in a typical rabbinical term, hyperbole, we call it today, exaggeration, if I could, Paul says, I would go to hell myself and be, uh, be there for all eternity if my brethren the Jews could, 
could receive Christ and receive Jesus as, as the Messiah. Uh, he had a tremendous passion for trying to save them, even though, as we know, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. <laughs> he mentions their privileges uh, very early on in chapter 9. He identified eight of them. They have the adoption, a national adoption, not an individual one like we have. They have the glory, the Shekinah glory of God to lead them in the wilderness. They had covenants. They had the law. They had the temple service. They had the promises. And they had the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and, of course, they have the Messiah, verse 5. According to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. You won't get too many more clear statements about the deity of Christ uh, than you have uh, there in verse, verse 5. So has God's plan failed? No, not actually. Yes, it's true. As a nation, they rejected uh, Jesus as the Messiah. But individually, they are still coming to faith in him. And he quotes the prophets in the Old Testament scriptures to show that that was God's plan all along. No, God's plan hasn't failed. Then in chapter 8, he explains that, that uh, Jews and Gentiles are both being saved uh, in the same manner. Where he quotes uh, in verse, or we quote him in verse 9. Uh, very important here if you're a, a Bible underliner. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek or Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, if you're if you're sharing your faith with somebody and you go through the issues and they understand the condemnation that they can be justified, uh, here's a very simple verse. Well, what do I do now? Well, it says right here in Romans 9, 10, and 9 and 10, just call on the name of the Lord. You need to believe that Jesus is the Lord. It's kurios. We went through uh, several scriptures to show Paul's uh, implication there. You need to believe that he is God come in the flesh. Uh, and that he died and that he rose again. And with that confession and that faith, uh, you are saved. Uh, it's simple. It makes a difference for all eternity. And then in chapter 11, he goes on and gives the literal future of the literal nation of Israel. Is God's promises filled? No. God is still going to keep all of his promises to the nation of Israel. Uh, in the first 10 verses, we talked about a believing remnant. In verse 11 to 24, a temporary rejection uh, but in verse 25 to 32, their full restoration. We said if we fail and understand Romans 9, 10, and 11, we will fail to evangelize Jewish people. Uh, we will become uh, anti-Semitic, uh, and we will fail to trust the promises of God. Because if he doesn't keep their promises to them, why would he keep his promises to us? But Paul uses them as an example. If, Paul, if God's going to keep his his promises to uh, an obstinate people who have rejected him, then certainly he's going to keep his promises to all of us, Jews and Gentiles together, uh, that are part of, of the church. So we believe that Israel back in the land today is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And the, I, I just can't tell you how excited I was to hear the Prime Minister of Israel uh, speaking before the United Nations and the General Assembly Benjamin Netanyahu say that and quote the scriptures as he's done many a times recently in the last two or three years. We've talked about the fact that, that uh, he has gotten very serious about studying the Bible. Uh, he has a group of, uh, of uh, rabbinical scholars come into his home with his family. They study uh, uh, on the Sabbath, on the Shabbat for two or three hours uh, at a time. And we've seen it come out in his speeches. Uh, Joel Rosenberg says, I have not seen a, a, a leader uh, of, the, of the Israeli nation do this since the very inception of, of the country in, uh, in 1948. But we see Netanyahu. And he talked about Iran and the problems with it, Iran. He says, but you know, the prophet Isaiah predicted that uh, there would be a, a national leader raised up in Iran. The prophet said his name would be Cyrus, and he would set our people free to bring them back in the land. And that prophecy was fulfilled. You see, the Jewish people have always had good relationships with the leadership and the people of Iran. It's only in the modern times that they've turned against the Jews. And he quoted scripture after scripture after scripture before the United Nations. Uh, and he's done that on many occasions. And we would agree with him. 
Uh, they are back in the land today in unbelief. God has gathered them from the nations of the world, uh, and we know they will be dispersed for a period of time during what we call the tribulation period, that last three and a half years of it. But God will watch over and protect a believing remnant. Of course, that's what Paul covers in the first ten verses there, and eventually be brought back into the land. Now, Paul addresses the Gentiles for the very first time in verse 17. And what, is his, what does he have to say to us Gentiles? Remember your Jewish roots. <laughs> That's the, the big instruction here for us, which, of course, the church has failed to do. There he says, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Uh, again, what Paul does is take an illustration from, from nature. Uh, there are natural uh, olives, olive trees, and, uh, uh, and the, the wild. The wild, if you take a branch off of it and you graft it in to the natural, will never produce any fruit. It will never produce any fruit. It's always done the other way. But that's his illustration. We take the wild and we plant it in. The Gentiles were planted into the Jewish roots of this uh, illustration in terms of the olive tree and then something supernaturally happens it produces fruit anyway the only reason that any Gentiles are ever saved by the grace of God is a supernatural work of God <laughs> because uh, Jesus we, gee we just weren't around we weren't part of the whole thing covenants weren't for us the Jewish Messiah Jewish scriptures but it's a miracle of God that we've gotten saved he says the problem is just don't forget that don't forget that the roots support you and not the other way around. But the church has done that. 85% of the church today worldwide rejects Israel, uh, rejects the promises made to Israel, they teach what we call replacement theology. They take all the promises made to Israel and now say they're now for the church because they reject their Messiah. Paul says that's not true. Uh, they have rejected him as a nation. Individuals are still coming. They're part of the church. And in the future, God is not done with Israel. His promises are true and he will keep them to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we live in those days. And it is amazing. It's amazing, the, the days that we're li living in. I mean, just some of the things that are going on right now. For example, Ezekiel says in the Magog invasion, for example, there's going to be a group of nations, Russia with Iran, and a group of other uh, nations that will make a move against Israel to destroy them. God will intervene supernaturally from above and destroy them. Now, what's very interesting about that is the nations that are not only mentioned, the ones that are not mentioned. Turkey is mentioned. Turkey is part of that. Up until recently, Turkey was almost a partner in NATO. They were very Western. You could go on vacation there. You can't anymore safely, most places, because their current president, Erdogan, he has moved them to more of an Islamic state. And it's interesting to watch that move because that falls right into the Magog invasion. Turkey's going to be right there with them going against Israel. And they were a friend and a partner of Israel right up until the last two or three years, the last couple of years. Uh, that's, that's really changed. It's also interesting what's happening in Egypt today because Egypt's not involved. Therefore, <laughs> an astute Bible scholar, when the Muslim Brotherhood took over to make it an Islamic nation, an astute scholar could have said, eh, that's not going to last because they're not part of it. The Muslim Brotherhood would have been part of any move against Israel. But not what's going on in that country uh, today as the military has taken over and trying to bring it back to a secular nation and so forth, even working and partnering with the, uh, uh, the nation of Israel going after the jihadist guys down there in the Sinai Peninsula and everything. There's just, it's just interesting. The Bible is just kind of unfolding uh, to us in, in the headlines every week. Uh, and Paul said that's the way it would be. God's not done with the nation of Israel. Uh, now, uh, the last couple of chapters, I'm only going to spend an hour on no, we're going to mention these very briefly. Uh, the practical application. We just went through this. Uh, we saw that, uh, that it began in chapter 12 uh, with the idea of a total commitment. Uh, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, uh, which is your spiritual act of worship. Picture of the burnt offering, our lives. And we said, this is a reasonable commitment. Based on where we were, our condition, and what God's done for us, it would be a reasonable thing to say, Lord, my life is yours. Like a burnt offering. The burnt offering goes on the offering. There ain't nothing left when it's all done. It's the idea of total commitment. And then he goes on to talk about, and 
And with that, then we'll know God's will. And by the way, God's given us spiritual gifts, one or, or many, to be used primarily for the blessing of the people and building up the body of Christ. And then he talked about what is real, genuine Christian love. And then he showed us and spelled this out for it, to us what that looked like. And then in chapter 13, hey, we all need to be in submission to the governing authorities over us. Uh, and then he spent chapter 14 and 15 on what do we do when we disagree? And we're going to have disagreements. And Paul gave some very specific uh, instructions about things from the word versus personal co convictions uh, and so forth. And the uh, rule over our lives is to be to love one another and have unity within the church. And then last week we covered his uh, personal his personal greetings uh, to the church. And we saw the heart of Paul and uh, the tremendous love that he had for the people and, uh, and they for him. I just want to uh, close it with one, uh, one illustration. And I know many of you are like, I can't believe it got done in all 16 chapters. But, uh, <clears throat> here's what I, what, uh, this, I'm hoping this illustration will help us understand, well, why did we do this? Why did we spend months uh, studying uh, the book of Romans? Uh, Jared Wilson in his book, Gospel Wakefulness, tells a story about a guy in his car who stalled on some railroad tracks. <laughs> trying to get the engine going, and uh, you know, he's not panicking yet, you know, just, you know. Now he hears the train, uh, and now he sees the train, and he, now forget the engine, he's just trying to get a seat belt off and get out of the car. But he's so terrified at this point, his hands are so stiff, his heart is beating, he can't get his seat belt undone to get out of the car, and now the, uh, the train is, it's, it's very close. Uh, then something very unexpected happens. He gets rear-ended. A truck hits him from behind and pushes him off the tracks. He slides off the track in time to turn and look around to see the, the man in the truck that did that for him get hit by the train and be driven down uh, the tracks uh, to his death. He gets out of his car uh, trembling and trying to take in what, what just happened. It's that some total stranger just basically died uh, to save, uh, save his life. He leans up on the, uh, on the trunk of his car and he's amazed that it's not, very, it's not much damage for what just happened. He's trying to get his cell phone out and still trembling uh, to try to call 911 or, or do something, uh, but just all of the, as we would be, the, uh, you know, that somebody died for me. I, I just, I don't know if I'll ever get over this. And then, he hears something in his truck, in his, his uh, trunk. It's like a whimper. And then he hears it a little more. So he pops the trunk and opens it. And there's his youngest son, who was playing hide and seek and jumped in the trunk right before he went away. Now, now, he has a, a greater revelation of what that guy just did. He not only saved him, but he saved his son that he didn't even know about at the time. A grace wakefulness. You know, we understand when we come to faith in Christ, to some degree what Christ has done, that's why we give our lives to him, because he saved us through his death on the cross. Uh, but there's a hope, I think, in the heart of the Apostle Paul that as we really understand grace, and we really understand the issues surrounding salvation, that there's a second light that goes off in our head and goes, now I understand a little more. You know, it's like the little boy. What does God look like? Well, I'll draw you a picture, you know. And, uh, and he says, well, let me draw you a picture of salvation. I know that you understand it already. These are believers. But I hope you understand it in a completely different way.